In Colin's memory, I want to speak tonight about the essential role that history plays in our democracy and why we're stronger as a nation when we face our history with courage and confidence and why we should always resist attempts by governments to censor that history. Recently, our parliament, our federal parliament, acknowledged the anniversary of the national apology to victims and survivors of institutional child sexual abuse. As everyone now concedes, these Australians experienced an unforgivable betrayal. But it was only after a Royal Commission revealed the undeniable scale of these crimes did the majority of Australians realise the extent of the abuse. Only then did we say sorry. On the anniversary of this apology, the Prime Minister told the Parliament, and I quote, Days of reckoning have become an important part of our national story. The apology to the stolen generations, the apology for forced adoptions, the apology to the forgotten Australians and former child migrants. The apologies reflect our acknowledgement of our failures as a people. As a liberal democratic, democratic people, we aren't afraid of our history, nor do we recoil from engaging with terrible truths. Our Prime Minister said that. And in fact, it was one of the truest things that our Prime Minister has said. As liberal democracies, we can face our past, but I'd go one step further, we must. As liberal, Demo uh, as liberal Democrats, as supporters of the free and open society, we stand or fall by our commitment to the truth. It's one of the things that separates us from totalitarians, people who want to erase uncomfortable memories from public life, who want to dominate the past in the way they dominate their people. We celebrate our successes and we face our failures with courage and the confidence that we can do better in the future. If you value living in a free society, you know that history is a precious thing. It's a gift, an endlessly fascinating, often surprising, always enriching gift. But it's also a tool. It has a purpose. We study history, and by doing so, we become stronger as a nation. It rarely offers us simple lessons. There's light and there's dark, and they're usually mixed in together. And this was something that Colin Tatz knew better than most. I feel truly privileged to be giving this lecture in his name tonight. It comes, I think, with an obligation to be honest, to avoid safe arguments or easy conclusions, because Colin never took the safe or easy path. Colin dedicated his life to studying humanity's darkest moments when racial hatred produced mass murder. He studied genocide. As a Jewish boy who grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust, as a South African who lived through the barbarism of apartheid, we can understand Colin's preoccupation with historic evil. But on a personal level, it must have been phenomenally difficult, staring into the abyss as he did. It was here in Australia that he founded the Centre for Comparative Genocide Studies. It was here that he conducted his work on the Shoah. This was a work of history. It was his attack on the idea that, to quote Colin, anti-Semitism arrived with Hitler from outer space in 1933. That was never true. The poison of anti-Semitism was spread by people, it was entrenched by institutions, it was enacted by communities. It could be traced backwards to actual decisions and actual causes. As he wrote, and I quote, this is this was a human event in history. It happened. It was done by people, so it must be explicable. Collins studied those truths because if he didn't, we would lose our shot at moral progress. Not every historian meets Collins' impossibly high bar. Indeed, some of his own students didn't, according to Sandra, perhaps even some of the students that were members of his family. But absolute primacy of the search for truth defines every serious work of history. Without the search for the full truth, the whole truth, history doesn't make sense. If you pull one thread from the tapestry because you don't like it, the whole picture falls apart. 
how could you teach the history of China without the Long March or the Cultural Revolution or Tiananmen Square? How could you teach the history of the United States without slavery or the Civil War or Freedom Rides? How could you teach the history of ancient Rome without the brutality and slaughter that won its empire and which paid for all the art, poetry, trade, architecture and political glory? Honesty doesn't always mean condemnation. It doesn't mean we give up our faith in redemption or forgiveness. These are great civilizations, some of the greatest in human history. Now, I understand the idea that there is one truth that can be pinned down is in itself contested. Of course, there will always be judgments and even arguments when we're writing history. None of us can have a perfect knowledge of the past. Some sources are too patchy. Sometimes the bridge of time and culture is too long to cross. When we study history, we're always making choices. The problem is people like the Federal Education Minister, Alan Tudge, want to make those choices themselves. They want the curriculum to reflect their politics more than the search for truth. They want to import ridiculous American history wars into Australian classrooms. But that's not protecting kids, that's weaponising them. We should be teaching our children that the contest of ideas is healthy. When little kids see their parents argue, it can be frightening. It can make them anxious. It's what happens next that matters. Do they talk it out? Does the stronger voice drown out everyone else's? The problem's not disagreement or contest or different points of view. It's keeping debates civil and grounded in fact. I'm on the public record uh, in my belief that Australian schools should be teaching our kids to cherish their citizenship, that students should learn and contemplate the citizenship pledge. It's freeing to know what it is to be a good citizen, to share democratic beliefs, respect the rights and liberties of others and obey the law. It is actually pretty simple. We don't pledge loyalty to the Crown in Australia anymore. We don't pledge loyalty to a political party or a particular religion. We pledge our loyalty to one another, to Australia and its people. I love this country, but I think love is deeper when it's more. It's what all religions teach their faithful, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it applies to history as much as to the human soul. We examine our past behaviour as a nation because we want to be better as a people. We face the past with courage because we are confident that as a people, it won't break us. I love my children more than life itself, but I don't think they're perfect. I draw their attention to how they can do better precisely because I love them. Some parents never pull their kids up and could honestly, anybody honestly say their kids are better off for it. History shows us where we have succeeded. By most measures, we're richer, we're freer, we're fairer, and we should be proud of those achievements. But history also shows us where we can improve as a nation. No serious athlete, no business leader, no scientist thinks that they can ignore their past performance and still become better. They do the opposite. They probe, they analyse, they look for points of weakness. They're hungry for the truth because that's what helps them improve. It's only totalitarian regimes who whitewash their history. It was Stalin who photoshopped old comrades, old comrades vault out of his pictures. It's totalitarians who seek to delete the past, who deny people the truth. And they're not acting out of strength, but out of insecurity. When we study history, it's not just victory or triumph that we teach as bravery. It's also resistance and even defeat. Resistance has formed us just as much as the decisions of the powerful have formed us. 
He suggested to a European that teaching kids about the Shoah was giving them a black armband view of history. You'd be rightly condemned as a denier. Yet there are people who would have us deny the impact of colonisation on First Nations Australians and deny the resistance that sustains Aboriginal Australians to this day. That doesn't make us stronger. It doesn't help us solve the problems that are still with us today because we can't heal intergenerational hurt until we face it. Sorry is a simple word, but when it's delivered sincerely, it can carry immense power. It took us too long to say it in this country. We know that now. And we still have so much to do to achieve true equality. But sorry was a precondition for moving forward. Truth, reconciliation and national progress walk hand in hand. Facing our history doesn't divide us, it unites us. It makes us tougher, more resilient, more mature as a country. After exercise, our muscles grow back stronger because of tiny tears that repair. When we repair the tears in our national fabric, we are stronger as a nation. When Julia Gillard announced her Royal Commission into Child Abuse, some very loud voices didn't want that to happen. It was controversial then, but no one thinks it's a mistake now. The truth, as painful as it was, has made us better. Colin understood this. That's why he dedicated his history, his career, to understanding humanity, humanity's very worst moments, even at enormous personal cost. As Colin taught us, we might be tempted to close our eyes, but we're always stronger when we confront the whole.